So let's start. Number 11, your brain was just head filler. Let's rewind a bit, like way back before brain scans, neurology, or even common sense. For most of history, people thought your brain was just there to keep your skull from echoing. It wasn't a powerhouse of thought or emotion. It was more like squishy insulation, a weird jelly cushion, the ancient Egyptians, who were advanced in many ways, still believed that all your thoughts, feelings, memories, and soul-related activities happened in the heart. The brain? Totally useless. They literally saw it as head stuffing, some organic styrofoam to keep your eyes from rattling around. During mummification, they took this belief to the next level. The heart was lovingly preserved in its own little jar, treated like sacred tech. The brain? <laughs> They stuck a long metal hook up the nostril, mashed it into goo, and pulled it out piece by piece, then threw it away like leftover spaghetti. No dignity, no backup. Just, meh, who needs this? Even Aristotle, one of the most celebrated thinkers in history, thought the brain's main job was to cool down the blood, like a built-in forehead air conditioner. Meanwhile, he credited the heart with managing thoughts, emotions, and basically running the show. It wasn't until much later, with the help of some curious dissections and a few brave neurologists, that we finally realized, oh hey, this gray blob actually runs everything, from remembering your mom's birthday to deciding not to text your ex. Thank your brain, the most underrated organ in history. Number 10. Farts were demons escaping the body. Back in medieval Europe, breaking wind wasn't just embarrassing, it was basically a spiritual purge. People genuinely believed that flatulence was the sound of demons being expelled from your body. Not metaphorically, literally. Your butt was seen as the emergency exit for evil spirits. Letting out a loud one? That was a demon getting evicted mid-tantrum, silent but deadly. That was a stealth mission, a sneaky demon extraction with bonus sulfur. Either way, you weren't just passing gas, you were performing an exorcism, a smelly one, but an exorcism nonetheless, and it didn't stop there. Some believe that holding it in was actually dangerous. If you trap those demonic gases inside, it could make you sick. Or even invite full-blown possession. The logic? If demons want out, don't block the exit. Let it rip. Preferably in a pew, apparently. This belief gave people a whole new excuse for crop dusting a room. A fart wasn't gross, it was heroic. You were cleansing your soul one toot at a time. So, yeah, next time someone clears the room after Taco Tuesday, just remember, in the Middle Ages they might have been considered a holy warrior. It wasn't just gas, it was ghost protocol. Colon cleansing, but with divine purpose. Number 9. You were made of four juices. Before modern medicine got all fancy with cells, enzymes, and microbiomes, ancient doctors believed your entire physical and emotional health came down to one thing, juice. No, not green smoothies, bodily fluids, specifically blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm. These were the four humors, and for centuries they were the MVPs of medical science. Your body was basically seen as a cocktail shaker. If your blend of humors got out of whack, you were doomed. Feeling angry? You probably had a yellow bile surplus. Feeling blue and melancholic? Black bile overflow? Got a cold or a cough? Welcome to the phlegm parade. This theory didn't stop at illness either. It explained everything, your personality, your mood swings, your relationships. Were you cheerful and energetic? That meant your blood was in the lead? Stoic and broody? black bile for days. Doctors at the time prescribed all sorts of weird solutions to rebalance your juices, including bloodletting, leech therapy, purging, or eating strange foods. Imagine getting dumped and your doctor goes, your blood's too optimistic. Try eating garlic and sticking a leech on your elbow. It was gross, and it was basically ancient medicine's version of a really confused juice cleanse. Number eight, women had wandering wombs. Ancient Greek medical theories were let's say, imaginative. One particularly wild idea, the female uterus could detach and go sightseeing around the body. According to Hippocrates and his bearded pals, if a woman felt dizzy, emotional, or just a little off, it might be because her womb had gone rogue, like it got bored and decided, I wonder what the lungs are up to. Their solution wasn't surgery or actual science, it was a bizarre form of aromatherapy. They'd wave pleasant smelling herbs near the pelvis to tempt the womb back to its 
home base while using foul odors near the nose to drive it away from more delicate real estate like the chest or head. It wasn't so much a treatment as it was womb wrangling. Ancient medicine often sounded less like healthcare and more like mythological pest control. Number seven, sight was caused by eye beams. Before anyone figured out optics or how eyeballs actually work, people thought vision was a two-way street with beams shooting out of your eyes like invisible feelers. According to this ancient theory, your eyes didn't receive light. They emitted it, like tiny laser pointers embedded in your face. This idea, known as the extramission theory, had big name supporters too. Plato himself co signed it. He believed your eyes cast out beams that interacted with objects, allowing you to see them. So, technically, if you stared at someone long enough in ancient Greece, you weren't being rude, you were physically poking them with your sight rays. Of course, this also meant that vision was useless in the dark. Not because there was no light, but because your eye beams had nothing to bounce off of. No surface equals no seeing. The logic kind of made sense. If you ignore physics, anatomy, and reality, and romantic eye contact, that took on a whole new meaning. Love at first sight was two people firing emotional lasers at each other across the room. Bottom line, ancient people thought your eyeballs were magic flashlights. And somehow, this idea held on for centuries. Number six, blood moved by sloshing around. Before scientists figured out that blood flows in a continuous loop, people had a much more fluid understanding of how it worked, literally. The theory went like this. Your blood wasn't circulating. It was just sort of hanging out loitering inside you like a warm puddle in a meat suit. There was no concept of arteries or veins as a closed system. Some thought the liver made all your blood and that it moved vaguely around your body, sometimes by gravity, sometimes by heat, sometimes just because. And if you exercised, the blood didn't pump, it just kind of vaporized into your muscles like tea steam then along came William Harvey in the 1600s, who basically shattered everyone's understanding by proving that blood doesn't just sit in your body, it moves like in a loop with the heart acting as a pump, revolutionary thinking for the time. Before that, the human body was basically treated like a medieval lava lamp, uh, just globs of blood floating around getting jostled when you moved or sneezed. The heart wasn't a pump. It was more like the body's emotional support organ. Number five, sneeze equals soul almost escaping. When someone says bless you after you sneeze, it might sound like a polite reflex today, but back in the day, it was basically an emergency spiritual lockdown. People genuinely believed that a sneeze was powerful enough to blow your soul right out of your body. The human body was thought of as a very sketchy container for the soul. Think spiritual Tupperware with a loose-fitting lid. So when you sneezed, that lid popped open. Your essence was halfway to the afterlife before you even had time to say a chew. Worse, some cultures believed sneezing didn't just eject your soul, it left you wide open to anything else wanting to hop in. Your body became a vacant hotel for passing spirits. Imagine being possessed by a ghost just because you had hay fever. That's why people rushed to say, bless you. It wasn't about manners. It was magical damage control. A verbal lock the doors before your soul wandered off or something spooky wandered in. Sneezing wasn't just a minor inconvenience, it was a spiritual jailbreak with real stakes. Number four, teeth had tiny worms in them. Have a toothache today? You head to the dentist. They say, looks like a cavity. Maybe you get a filling, maybe a root canal. But if you lived a few centuries ago, they tell you there's a tiny worm inside your tooth and it's having the time of its life. For centuries, people believed that tooth pain wasn't caused by bacteria or decay. It was caused by actual living worms burrowing into your teeth. These imaginary intruders were blamed for everything from mild sensitivity to full-blown rot. If your molar hurt, that was the worm partying. Swollen gums, the worm redecorating its little condo. This theory led to some wild treatments. People tried to smoke the worm out using burning herbs, garlic fumes, or strange oils. Some even drilled into their teeth, not to fix them, but to give the worm a way to crawl out. Yep, they literally made worm exits in their teeth. It was like the exorcist, but for your mouth. And here's the wildest part. 
This wasn't some ancient Babylonian myth that died out early. The toothworm belief stuck around into the 1800s. So while some people were inventing steam engines, others were trying to evict imaginary worms with mouth smoke. Number three, sneaky organs could turn into animals. Okay, this one sounds like fan fiction, but stay with me. It was taken seriously in traditional Chinese medicine and other ancient systems of thought. The belief went like this. If your body and spirit were out of balance, your internal organs might not just fail, they might transform into animals. And no, this wasn't a metaphor. It was seen as a real physical possibility. Your liver could become a dragon. Your spleen might shapeshift into a snake. Your heart overwhelmed with grief could literally sprout wings and fly away like a bird on a dramatic emotional exit. These transformations weren't random, they were tied to your emotional state. If your spirit was disturbed or your moral compass out of whack, your organs would react accordingly. Not with illness, but with mythical rebellion. You weren't just sick, you were betrayed by your spleen. It sounds ridiculous now, but back then it was a legit diagnostic framework. Medicine met mythology, and your organs became characters in an epic soap opera starring your own body. Number two, you could absorb power by eating people. In ancient and medieval medicine, cannibalism wasn't always seen as creepy. It was sometimes considered downright therapeutic. People genuinely believed that by eating parts of the human body, you could absorb strength, vitality, or even cure specific illnesses. This wasn't just some backwoods legend, it had mainstream high society appeal. In fact, European aristocrats, yes, actual kings and queens, were all in on this macabre wellness trend. They imported powdered mummy dust from Egyptian tombs and called it mumia. It was believed to be packed with mystical healing properties. Pharmacists mixed it into tonics, wrapped it in pills, and even stirred it into fancy chocolates. Because why have cocoa nibs when you can have a side of 3,000 year old pharaoh? And get this, some people didn't wait for dead royalty. They went to public executions with a cup in hand, ready to collect fresh blood from the condemned. Why? because it was believed that warm human blood could treat epilepsy, boost vitality, or maybe even cheat death. Executions were like grim juice bars for the bold and unhinged. Next time someone gives you side eye for drinking beet juice or adding chia seeds to your smoothie, just remind them, at least it's not mummy dust and murder blood. Number one, laughter could dislodge your organs. Today, laughter is considered the best medicine. But back in the Middle Ages, it was practically a medical emergency. Some physicians genuinely believed that laughing too hard could knock your organs out of place, like your guts were Jenga blocks held together by good posture and prayer, a hearty belly laugh. That wasn't harmless fun. <laughs> it was an internal earthquake. They warned it could jostle your heart, displace your lungs, or, if you were a woman, send your womb rolling around your abdomen like a marble in a washing machine. Medical texts of the time didn't just suggest this casually, they urged people, especially women and the delicately built, to avoid excessive mirth. Laughter, they said, could strain your innards to the point of disaster. Fragile bodies, after all, were seen as being loosely fastened together with vibes and twine. So imagine you're sitting by the fire in 1407, someone drops a hilarious punchline, and instead of bursting out laughing, everyone just kind of nods and exhales sharply through the nose, because if they laugh too hard, they might need a medieval organ relocation specialist. Joy might be therapeutic now, but back then it was a hazard. Thank you for watching and sticking till the end. We've got plenty more videos coming in the future. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss them. See you in the next one.